The National Association of Drug Court Professionals is proud to present Strange Bedfellows, the political appeal of drug courts. This groundbreaking discussion will examine the widespread support behind the one issue that has people from every political background in agreement. Please welcome your moderator from the great state of Minnesota, former U.S. Congressman and tireless champion of drug courts, Jim Ramstad. Good morning. I'm Jim Ramstead, a grateful recovering alcoholic. I woke up in a jail cell July 31st, 1981, under arrest for a variety of offenses. And I'm here alive and sober today only because of the access that I had to treatment. The same access that you provide people in your drug courts each and every day across America. Thank you for the, all the work that you do. I think President Kennedy said it best in 1961 when he said, here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. All of you drug court professionals are doing God's work here on earth each and every day, and I salute you. This is truly a watershed moment for drug courts, and it's fitting that we're gathered here in our nation's capital. From our representatives in Congress to our state and local leaders, never before has there been such widespread support for drug courts. At the same time, never before has it been so vital, so important that we take our message to Capitol Hill and push our champions to fund drug courts at a minimum of $88.7 million for fiscal year 2012. Remember that dollar figure, $88.7 million is what is absolutely necessary for fiscal year 2012. In order to carry this message effectively, we must understand the wide-ranging rationale underlying support for drug courts. And that's what this panel here today, this distinguished panel here today, is all about. We have brought together leaders from all sides of the aisle, from different walks of life, to explore what may be the only national issue today at which, on which there is, there is bipartisan agreement. I mean, when was the last time that Newt Gingrich and Al Franken agreed on anything? Conservatives and liberals, moderates alike, agree that the ongoing budget crisis provides a unique opportunity to end America's costly over-reliance on incarceration. As a good friend of mine, Jim Baxstrom, a uh, prosecutor back home in Minnesota in Dakota County puts it, we cannot incarcerate our way out of this drug problem. Drug courts, as you all know, sit squarely at the center of the reform. Their widespread support is not born of the same political principles. Drug courts derive from the principles of saving money, saving lives, eliminating racial disparities, protecting public safety, cutting crime, restoring families, helping veterans, stopping impaired drivers, and so forth. Drug courts are championed by pragmatists on all sides of the de debate concerned about all of these issues. Over the next hour, drug court professionals, you will gain a better understanding of the vastly different political and personal motivations behind drug court support, helping you to more effectively communicate with stakeholders from different political backgrounds and viewpoints. In other words, you will have the tools after listening to this panel to make anyone on Capitol Hill and everyone a champion of drug courts. Let's get into our panel. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, this distinguished group. First, the Honorable Asa Hutchinson, my former colleague in Congress and dear friend. 
Asa began his career as a trial attorney in Arkansas before being appointed by President Reagan to be United States Attorney for Northwest Arkansas. In 1996, Asa won a congressional seat and served the people of Arkansas for three terms. Asa was then appointed by President George W. Bush to be the administrator of the Drug Enforcement Agency, where he served until 2003, when he was again appointed by President Bush to run the largest division of the Department of Homeland Security, including TSA. Throughout his distinguished career, Asa Hutchinson has been respected by colleagues on both sides of the aisle. He's been respected as a tough but fair leader, and he has been, most importantly, a champion of drug courts. It's good to have you with us, Asa. Our next panelist, you all know, is one of the world's most celebrated actors, Martin Sheen. As you also know, Martin needs absolutely no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Martin has appeared in over 60 feature films and, of course, is remembered in this town primarily for his role as President Jed Bartlett in the celebrated television show The West Wing. But many of you are also familiar with Martin's role as a champion, a true champion of drug court. Martin has appeared at several NADCP conferences and just last March spoke passionately at a drug court briefing we held on Capitol Hill. Martin is an activist who has raised awareness for numerous social causes across this country and across the world and is a tireless seeker of justice. Mr. President, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. probably also recognize another celebrated actor, Harry Lennox. You recognize Harry Lennox. <laughs> Harry has appeared on some of our most popular television shows from ER to 24 and House. He has also appeared in over a dozen movies, including the Matrix series, Get on the Bus, and The Five Heartbeats. Harry is regarded by his peers as a master of the craft. Jet Magazine, in fact, has called him Hollywood's best kept secret. And most recently, he bought, brought down the house at the BET Awards, performing alongside his original cast, members of the Five Heartbeats to mark the 20th anniversary of the classic film. What you may not know about Harry Lennox is that he has a deep and abiding interest in drug courts and criminal justice reform. Last year, Harry participated in NADCP's No More PSA campaign, and he is particularly interested in eliminating racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Harry, thank you for your time and your dedication to drug courts. Thank you. The fourth distinguished member of our panel, you've already heard from, Chief Justice Sue Bell Cobb of the Supreme Court of Alabama. Chief Justice Cobb, congratulations again on your well-deserved award here today. Your commitment to drug courts in Alabama has been truly outstanding in establishing a drug court in every single county in your great state. Chief Justice Cobb, thank you for your important leadership and again, congratulations on your award. The fifth panelist is a person guaranteed to make you laugh. Alonzo Bowden was the winner of the third season of the hit show Last Comic Standing. He has appeared He has appeared on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno, 
Late Night with Conan O'Brien, The Late Show with Craig Ferguson, Comedy Central Presents, Showtime at the Apollo, to name only a few. You can see, currently, you can see Alonzo on the hit television show, Inside the Vault with Chris Collinsworth. Alon Alonzo recently completed a USO tour and became interested in military and veterans issues. Very, very involved in military and veterans issues. In fact, tonight, this is announced, an announcement that I don't think has been made before here. And tonight, Alonzo will be performing along with Denny Sywell's trio at the Jokes and Jazz Benefit for Justice for Vets right here at National Harbor. I hope to see each and every one of you at Justice for Vets right here tonight. The next member of the panel, the sixth member, is Buddy Gilmore from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Buddy's CEO of Shape Technologies, which is an innovative company that provides system solutions to national security threats. Buddy served his country in the United States Air Force for 20 years, retiring as a Master Sergeant in 1992. Buddy is active in Colorado Springs politics for he is close to the Tea Party. Buddy, thank you for your service to our country and thank you for all you do for drug courts and for being with us here today. Buddy Gilmore. And I know our next panelist needs no introduction to this audience. Welcome home, Judge Karen Freeman Wilson. As most of you know, Judge Freeman Wilson is former Chief Executive Officer of this great organization, NADCP. Judge Freeman Wilson is an inductee into the Stanley Goldstein Drug Court Hall of Fame. She is the recipient, yes, yes. That's a big deal. The judge is also the recipient of the prestigious Sagamore of the Wabash Award from former Governor Indiana Governor Evan Bayh. She has enjoyed a long and distinguished career in public service, serving as Indiana Attorney General, serving as a judge in Gary, Indiana, the Executive Director of the Indiana Civil Rights Commission, a Deputy Prosecutor, and a Public Defender. Most recently, Judge Freeman Wilson won the Democratic primary in the Gary, Indiana mayoral race, where she has made public safety a key to her platform and pledged to support rehabilitation for those who express a sincere desire to become protect, productive members of society. Judge, it's an honor to have you with us here today. <laughs> now to the questions. We will have seven primary questions and uh, each primary question will have two follow-up questions asked of different panelists. First question goes to my friend and former colleague, Asa Hutchinson. Asa, there's no doubt that our criminal justice system needs reform. We spend upwards of $70 billion, that's billion with a B, each and every year on corrections. And yet prison and criminal justice spending has done very little to stem the tide of crime and drug abuse. In fact, I would argue it's made it worse. You recently signed on to the Right on Crime initiative, which urges conservatives to take up the mantle of criminal justice and drug courts reform. Why are drug courts an essential part of the conservative approach to criminal justice reform, particularly as it relates to cutting down crime? Thank you, Jim, and uh, it's good to see you again. Wonderful to serve with you in Congress, and I see Judge uh, Karen Freeman Williams Wilson, who also does a, has done a great job and actually called on me when we worked together when I was head of the DEA. And now that I'm back in the private sector, I actually have time to work out and do things like that, and I went into my uh, exercise facility, and the owner came up to me. It was the first time I had been there, and the owner came up to me and said, uh, Mr. Hutchinson, 
years ago, you sent me to prison for cocaine. And he said, and I was just waiting for blows or whatever he was going to come out of his mouth. And he said, I want to thank you for turning my life around. And he got out of prison. He uh, rehabilitated himself. He is an owner of a business. And I tell that story because, Jim, it makes a difference that whenever you're on the law enforcement side, we have to recognize that many times it is an arrest that triggers treatment. Now, this gentleman went to prison, but we have alternatives to prison today that need to be considered, and one of those biggest alternatives is drug treatment courts. And I'm here to applaud you, as I did as head of the DEA. Well, I went in, uh, to different drug courts, and one of them I went to in, in Compton, California. Uh, what a terrific drug court there in, in uh, that city, doing great work. And I watched the graduates cross the stage. And one of the graduates crossed the stage, and after receiving the diploma, uh, getting acknowledged from the judge that uh, they completed their treatment, the first person the graduate hugged was the arresting officer and said, thank you, sir, for saving my life. And so law enforcement should not be opposed to drug treatment courts. We're not on different pages. We're on the same pages. We have to work together. The question that was asked to me is why conservatives can be supportive today. I am supportive of the Right on Crime initiative that tells conservatives it's okay to look at prison policy and alternatives to incarceration for nonviolent offenders. And the reason is that, first of all, it is an effective solution. Conservatives looking at government wants government to work well. Drug courts is a success story. Secondly, you emphasize individual responsibility. The individual that comes before you with a uh, with an addiction problem, they are neglecting their family, they're neglecting their job, their responsibilities, you're teaching them responsibility. That is a conservative principle. And then thirdly, it's cost effective. With this budget crisis that we have today, we have to look for cost effective solutions and drug treatment courts meets that criteria. And that is the reason I think you see some willingness in the Republican Congress working in a bipartisan way to uh, fund drug treatment courts. Finally, I never like to speak to an audience about the problem with drugs without recognizing some success. President Obama, meeting with another country's leader who's always complaining about the demand problems in the United States, he pointed out that we've reduced overall drug consumption in this country by 50%. That's a success story. But it's difficult. It's difficult to get beyond that whenever you have addiction problems in our country. And to further reduce demand, we have to have success stories like drug treatment courts. And Jim, that's why I'm delighted to be here with you today. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Administrator. Thank you. Next, we'll go to you, Mr. President, Martin Sheehan. I think it's fair to say that your politics are different from Asa Hutchinson's. <laughs> and I think it's fair to say that you approach the issue from a different political perspective. Yet you, too, are one of the most outspoken champions of drug courts. How does your support, Martin, how does your support for drug courts tie into your political ideology or to your core value system? Well, um, I come to. Uh, my support of, of drug court uh, through my work uh, uh, of, of, with social justice, I really can't separate it. Uh, knowing how drug court goes right to the center of the problem and deals with the people that are affected by it. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson mentioned uh, Compton Drug Court, which I'm very familiar with. I, too, have uh, attended graduation ceremonies there and have seen firsthand the miraculous recovery of people that before drug court were just thrown away and added to an already overcrowded and tragic uh, prison population. Uh, personally, uh, I think that, you know, uh, if you don't take something personal, it's impersonal. If it's impersonal, it's never going to uh, have an effect on anyone. And so I take it personal, but I always have to preface my involvement not as a professional, but as an advocate. 
and being here today with all these professionals, I just always have to make that clear. The difference between celebrity and credibility sometimes is it's very wide. Um, but my own personal involvement has, has been with Drugport for nearly 15 years now. And personally, I got involved with a organization in Berkeley, California. I have many friends in that area, in the Bay Area. And we started an organization about 15 years ago called Options with Dr. Davida Cody, a dear friend of mine and an addiction specialist in the Bay Area. And we focused primarily on homeless uh, uh, people who were primarily crack uh, addicted. We got involved with the Berkeley Police Department and a drug court advocate. And in the, in the last 15 years, we've established five um, uh, as, uh, what we call safe houses, but they're uh, sober living houses. They're five for men, three for women. They are all run by former crack addicts who were homeless on the streets. That's just one indication of the success of this program. Uh, you know, the, the final step of any 12-step program is to pass it on, and that is a reflection of the old adage that if you want to um, keep anything of real value, you must give it away with love. And that's a very clear reflection of what Drug Court does. Well, Martin, as someone who's walked the halls with you, uh, of, of the halls of Congress, uh, thank you for your strong, active support of drug courts. As Wes Huddleston told me, whenever he calls Martin Sheehan for help to come to an event, Martin never says no. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> the second follow-up question goes to Judge Karen Freeman Wilson. Judge Freeman Wilson is Attorney General of Indiana, CEO of NADCP, a judge, and now in your bid for mayor in Gary, Indiana, you navigate wide-ranging political views. What aspects of drug courts do you find appeals to both conservatives and liberals? I think it's important to look at the fact that um, it addresses the revolving door of justice. Um, whether you're at the local, the state, the federal level in uh, crime prevention and law enforcement, you understand quickly that uh, people keep coming back. And it's not because they enjoy the accommodations in the local jails or the state prisons. It's because they have the underlying issue of addiction. If you don't address it, then you won't stop recidivism. And so by addressing it through drug treatment court, you minimize uh, the chance, the opportunity for people to come back, but you also maximize their opportunity to be productive citizens in the community. It's common sense as it relates to really increasing your tax base as someone who's looking at the mayor's office. It's uh, common sense as it relates to uh, making uh, reuniting people with their families, uh, helping them to get their lives back. And so whatever angle you look at it from, whether you're trying to save money, whether you're trying to save lives, they're not mutually exclusive, they go together. And to the extent that that's true, that drug court gets it done. Well. Well, thank you, Judge Freeman Wilson. Uh, Thank you for your contribution to drug courts. Uh, I uh, think the uh, people of Gary, Indiana are going to be very fortunate to have you serve as their mayor. Thank you again, Judge. <laughs> Question number two goes to Chief Justice Sue Bell Cobb. Chief Justice Cobb, the theme of this year's drug conference, as you know, is that drug courts are a proven budget solution. We know that drug courts save money. We have all the empirical data in the world to support that fact. Drug courts save the criminal justice system $3.36 for every $1 invested and up to $27 for every $1 invested when we consider other community savings such as reduced victimization, healthcare utilization, foster care, and so forth. 
and leading the way to put a drug court in every county in Alabama. What has been your experience regarding the cost savings of drug courts? Um, and particularly, as all of you know, the one thing that we have in common, if you are uh, from an energy producing state, your budget's not in shambles, perhaps, but for all of the rest of the states, our state budgets are truly in shambles. And so if there's a, a costly reform, it's going to be in a holding pattern. The beauty of drug courts is with a modest amount of changing the way that we spend money, we can bring about amazing benefits and save not only local but also state funding. Um, really, with, with drug courts, we can cobble together resources from a variety of stakeholders and bring about such a positive uh, benefit. And so for all Chief Justices and those in courts, we know that for every dollar saved, of incarceration, that's a dollar that can be spent on treatment, a dollar that could be spent on the arts, a dollar that could be spent on public education. And it's literally just convincing our legislatures that really have the, they're the, have the purse strings, that we've just got to alter how this money is spent, but that we save so much. You know, as it's already been said, we can, we can build another prison, which in Alabama, you know, we desperately really need to do based on the overcrowding, but we mustn't do that because that's not the appropriate best practice because what we're doing is not working. So why continue spending unbelievable amounts of money for something that's not working? We know that drug courts work, so that's how we ought to spend our money. Thank you, Chief Justice, and your, your record in, in, in at home has been just remarkable and putting a drug court in every single county. Congratulations again. Next follow-up goes to Buddy Gilmore. Buddy, you've never been accused of being a liberal. You uh, are certainly uh, considered a strong fiscal conservative. How, Buddy, this is a real important question given the makeup, especially of the United States House. How, Buddy, do we best present the cost savings of drug courts to more, the more conservative members of Congress, sp specifically the Tea Party uh, uh, 87 Republican freshmen who uh, probably, some of them don't know a lot about drug courts. How do we best present the cost savings argument to these members to convince them to support drug courts? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, obviously, when we're talking fiscal conservatism, we start talking numbers, so I, I'll, I'll try to stick with uh, some pure numbers that really drive home the idea about uh, our savings. You look at the, the total amount spent in 2007 for incarceration in our, our country, and, and uh, there was about $70 billion there uh, from the federal government uh, supporting incarceration. But when you toss in the state cost and, and the local and county cost, you're talking over $226 billion uh, of a very tight federal budget and, and state and local budget that goes toward incarceration. You also look at, at 2007 from the DOJ numbers and you see that 1.6 million people were arrested in our country for drug and alcohol abuse and, and, and uh, drug and alcohol crimes. That's a huge number to me. Uh, you've, you've heard uh, some of us talk about savings already where the savings are around $7,000 or, or the cost of running through a, a drug court uh, program is about $7,000. In 2008, we had around 112,000 people enrolled in drug courts, and I think that's a tremendous number. Uh, at, at, and at the most conservative numbers that you look at, we see that there's better than a two-to-one savings. So for about $860 uh, million invested in uh, drug courts, uh, we see a savings of about $1.6 billion. We also see other kinds of savings, ancillary savings, for instance, the number of uh, uh, babies that are born drug-free, uh, recognizing that about a thousand of those babies last year can now be recognized as being tied back to uh, uh, drug treatment courts. And that, that, that represents about a million dollars in savings per child from, age, from, from birth to age 18. So there, there, there's a real clear case for fiscal conservatives to tie together with moderates and liberals and come together and support drug courts. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Buddy, for standing tall for drug courts and uh, for being such an outstanding member of the board of NADCP. We appreciate all you do. The next uh, follow-up goes to Asa Hutchinson. Asa, 
one of the questions we're going to get tomorrow from United States Senators and members of Congress is why do we need to make a federal investment in drug courts? Could you explain why a federal investment is important in drug courts? Historically, we've had a joint partnership, federal and state, local working together to fight the drug problem. And the federal government has played a, a massive role in leading the anti-drug effort from ONDCP advertising funding, funding, which has been on the decline, to internationally the $1.3 billion we're spending in the Merida Initiative helping Mexico. Before that, it was Colombia with over a billion dollars in Plan Colombia. So historically, we have led in that effort. And investment in drug courts is consistent with that historic role. Right now, if President Obama goes to Mexico, they raise the issue, you've got to reduce the demand of drugs in the United States. Colombia, South America, Central America makes the same case. Canada makes the same case. Look at your own demand problems. And the answer is that I, we need to invest in the federal level on demand reduction and the most successful effort, I would say, is not necessarily the advertising budget, but it is what is happening in drug courts across this country to reduce addiction. And that is a consistent demand source. And, and, and finally on this point, I think you've got to make the case that you know, it is such a small amount of dollars, relatively speaking, that the federal government invests in drug courts versus what the state and locals are putting into drug courts in terms of human resources. It's the judges, it's the personnel, it's the prosecutors, it's the probation officers. These are state resources, human resources that are being devoted, and it's rational that the federal government leads with some assistance and funding to help cover uh, the drug courts and expand their operations. Asa, thank you. you. Nobody says it with more authority and better experience than you. Thank you. One thing Asa said triggered uh, something in my mind. Uh, during President Clinton's first term, I had the pleasure of going with him and uh, three or four other members of Congress to Mexico. And I'll never forget at a meeting with President Zadeo and his drug minister, uh, President Clinton said, um, we've got to do more to uh, stop the flow of drugs coming from south of your country, Mexico, to the United States. And President Zadeo said, with all respect, Mr. President, until you Americans deal with the demand side of the equation, we're never going to be able to address the supply side problem. And uh, that is so true, and you reinforce that, certainly, uh, Asa Hutchinson. The third question goes to Martin Sheehan. Martin, one aspect of drug courts that is sometimes overlooked when we talk about saving money and cutting crime is other effects on communities. Every benefit of drug court we have heard thus far has a huge effect on our communities. You live in Los Angeles, as we know, and uh, Los Angeles has some of the best drug courts in the country. Let me ask you a pointed question. If you were president of the United States, the real president of the United States, what proposal would you send to Congress that would do the most to strengthen communities? I would raise the budget of drug court about 30, That's the right 30 answer. billion dollars. <laughs> you know, one thing that I wanted to make mention of in the wonderful video we saw before with all those wonderful participants, including Matthew and, and uh, Melissa, who are not up here with us, but uh, it was emphasized over and over again that drug court is not easy. It's not an easy alternative. It's going to cost you a different uh, expenditure. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a sweat uh, equity. It's going to cost you something. Uh, Mr. Hutchins and I were talking before we came out here about uh, some of the, um, uh, the qualifications that, that, in, that a, um, a, a, an addict has to uh, uh, qualify for, and that is one, is it, it must be nonviolent. The crimes that brought them to the bench in the first place have to be nonviolent crimes, crimes they committed because they were addicted. Uh, they also cannot have used a weapon. And in some states, I'm, I just learned this this morning, uh, sex offenders are not included in drug court. 
Uh, maybe they are in other states, but uh, in the ones we discussed, they are not. Uh, so it's not an easy um, uh, uh, road, and it, 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 it's a long and arduous journey. It's, it, it's, but drug court makes it available to many of the low income and uh, unemployed, homeless, uh, 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 people who, who ordinarily could not aff uh, afford uh, a decent attorney to begin with, you know. Uh, many of the people that come to drug court have uh, public defenders. Uh, but all the people that are working, you people that are present here today and all across the country in the 2,500 courts uh, have a sweat equity that is worth far more than any dollar amounts. And you see right in front of you every single day uh, in session the miracles that, that occur with recovery. And it reminds me of the, the, the old Irish story about the guy who comes to the gates of heaven and, and asked to be let in. And St. Peter said, of course, just show us your scars. And the man said, I have no scars. And St. Peter says, what a pity. Was there nothing worth fighting for? I think drug court is worth fighting for. Thank you, Martin. The uh, second follow-up question, uh, or the first follow-up, rather, goes to uh, Harry Lennox. Harry, uh, restoring families, as we know, doesn't always mean reuniting children with their parents, as many parents are MIA. Sometimes it means getting juveniles back on track. What are the long-term effects of intervening when a juvenile is on the brink of a life of substance abuse and crime? but I was at a, a time in my life a public school teacher. And uh, I was taught for eight years in the city of Chicago and saw firsthand the ravages that the drug community, uh, that the drug uh, addiction can have on a community. And I know that sometimes while uh, re reuniting families includes getting parents back into their children's lives in a responsible way, Frequently, we don't have access to that as people who are living in the community, who have come from the community, uh, and who are teaching in the community. Sometimes we actually have to directly have a, have to intervene at the level of the child or the student. And I know personally, having uh, been in the system of Chicago, that uh, if you can step in and, and prevent somebody from getting involved in drugs immediately, uh, you know, at the, at the start, that it has a long-term impact and that it can have a, a tremendous, it can be a tremendous benefit uh, to the community as a whole. So I think that uh, really the benefits of it are, are pretty self-evident, uh, particularly when you deal on the front line of, having, uh, of, of seeing what drugs do in the inner city in particular. Thank you very much, uh, Harry. And, and Harry Lennox, thank you for lending your good name, your star-studded name to uh, support drug courts. We appreciate your active participation in being here today. Thank you, Harry Lennox. <laughs> the second follow-up here goes to Chief Justice Cobb. Uh, Chief Justice, uh, you've put a drug court, as we all know, in every county in the state of Alabama. What? Uh, effect has that had on overall crime and uh, public safety? What have been the effects of, of crime overall? Well, Jim, first, as a former trial judge, I was a trial judge for 13 and a half years and tried cases in 40 of Alabama's 67 counties, and then 12 years on the Court of Criminal Appeals. I am here to tell you that they're victims on both sides of crime. You have the victims of crime, your, your typical victims, those that perhaps have been hurt or uh, something uh, terrible has happened to them, but you also have the victims of the offender's family. I have seen families come in, the families of defendants, and you can see written across their face, this was not how my life was supposed to turn out. So for drug court, it literally repairs families because we know that dealing with addicts, that what, what replaces everything else that's most important in life, you know, whether it's your faith, your family, uh, even work, what replaces it? Drugs. So what, what drug court does is change that priority so that families, once again, 
become what they should be, and that is our top priority. And in doing that, we see that crime goes down. We know that drug courts work. And the reason the Conference of Chief Justices are such tremendous advocates, have so many resolutions in support of drug court, is because of the public safety, is stopping the victims, both on the side of the offender's family as well as those that are in the future path of that offender. We know that it reduces crime. It's public safety, public safety. We can talk about the savings and that they're immense, but it does work. It does reduce crime. Uh, and what it does is make that offender understand yet again that um, they have a chance to be what God intended them to be in the first place. And drug court is what gives them that opportunity. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Chief Justice. Question number four goes to Judge Freeman Wilson. Judge Freeman Wilson, uh, we, we, we can see and we all know how interconnected these issues are. Uh, one of the reasons I came to support drug courts uh, was a pro profound effect I saw that drug courts had back in Minnesota on lifting people out of poverty and people getting jobs and uh, reuniting with their families and uh, so forth really economic freedom. Uh, in your experience, Judge Freeman Wilson, uh, is or are drug courts working to help people come out of poverty? Absolutely, Congressman. Um, one of the greatest aspects of drug courts is that it is just one of the roads to recovery. And what makes it uh, one of the greatest roads is the fact that there are support services available in drug court. Whether you're talking about uh, the requirement that uh, participants get employment, or whether you're talking about the community service requirement of drug courts, or even the fact that there is a reuniting process with families for those in family uh, treatment court uh, there is a family component, a personal component uh, for drug court. And to the extent that people who are involved in drug court become productive members of the community, become good parents, become good children, and take care of their parents as they age, that is extremely important. But it all starts with being involved in drug court being able to access some of those services through education, through employment, and to then uh, be involved in a life in the community. Uh, things start with graduation from drug court. Uh, that's why they call it a commencement, because that's where people who are drug court graduates then become uh, members of the community tax-paying citizens, uh, and those who contribute to the community rather than take away. Thank you, Judge. Judge, if I lived in Gary, Indiana, I'd vote for you. Next question goes to Alonzo <laughs> Bowden. Alonzo, it's, it's not just about rising out of poverty, but it's also about acquiring the skills, the necessary skills to permanently stay on track. What changes have you seen in people when they're able to kick addiction, to deal with addiction, get into recovery, and lead a sober lifestyle? Well, um, <laughs> it's funny you ask me that. What changes do I see in people? I've been sober for 23 years. And And if you told me 23 years ago when I was hitting the crack pipe that, you know, one day you're going to be sitting on a dais next to a member of the Tea Party and the Chief Justice of Alabama. <laughs> you know, I might say, really? <laughs> well, your stuff is better than mine. Uh, <laughs> It really is, the, the, I think the changes, you know, and, and I'm looking at this, because they, they wrote up little, little scripts and talking points for us, and they're looking at the changes they describe, things about making car payments, opening a bank account, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, 
the change for the addict in sobriety is small things. And, and the little things are things I'll always remember. The first time I went to a job and didn't worry about taking a drug test is huge. Um, you know, car payments don't come in until about four or five years of sobriety. <laughs> when, I, when I came in, my sponsor told me, he said, maybe the most spiritual thing you'll ever do is pay your phone bill because it was something I never did before. And I kept the same phone number for 17 years because I paid the bill every month. Those, those are the kind of changes that come to a sober life. You really, you really have no idea when you come in and when you get sober how your life is gonna change. And the people who help you get sober or who are people like this who make the possibility, um, arrange for the possibility, finance it, et cetera. You have no idea the impact you're gonna make on people's lives. Um, it, is, it is a huge change. I am not the person I was when I got here. Well said, Alonzo, great. I told you he'd make you laugh. Asa, the next question goes to you. We all know uh, we're still, as Americans, feeling the effects of recession. 14 million people looking for jobs, uh, many local economies hurting. What effect do drug courts have on the economies of local communities and our nation as a whole? The answer is it's, it's the difference between a short-term fix and a long-term solution. Whenever I was head of the DEA, we would get too many calls from chiefs of police of a community that say, we have a serious crime problem, drug problem in a particular area. We need extra resources. Can the feds come in and help us out? And we would do that. We would come in there. We would arrest people. We would go away. Six months later, the same crime problems are back. The same uh, uh, drugs on the corner are all back there because the law enforcement resources went away. And so we started this project where if they ask us to come in with more federal law enforcement resources, we would say, what is your community doing? Does your community have a drug treatment court in place so that if we take the drug source out, do you have a long-term solution? And do you have good rehabilitation? Do you have residential services? What's the community doing? Do you have a 501C that will support the effort? And so what it does to a community is extraordinary if you have the commitment of the community through drug treatment courts for a long-term solution. And I visited with some great people over from uh, West Virginia before I came up here today who has a drug court there and they were talking about the challenges and they said that they have more community support, a 501c3 that's been created that will support it. And I think these are the innovative approaches that we have to have for long-term solutions with drug treatment courts. It's not always gonna be the federal government coming in and saying, here's your check. It's gonna be that partnership that each of you manifest that's here today. So it makes an extraordinary impact long-term in the community when you have this type of solution. Buddy, we're back to you. You bring a uh, crucial political perspective to this discussion. Uh, as a member of the Tea Party in Colorado Springs, uh, I know you're very concerned about uh, state and federal spending. Uh, two questions, Buddy. How did you come to support drug courts, to be such an ardent supporter of drug courts? And secondly, is this a position that others in the Tea Party share? Well, thank you for the question. My, my involvement in drug courts is relatively new uh, compared to most of the folks in this room. Uh, you have to understand that uh, my city of about 420,000 people is made up of almost 45% of the, uh, the adult population of veterans. We're also surrounded by five military installations, including one of the largest army installations in the United States. In the early 2009, we were kind of facing a, a perfect storm there in Colorado Springs. We had a large number of troops coming back from Afghanistan, from Iraq. Uh, the 4th ID there was suffering more casualties, more fatal casualties than any other unit in the United States. At the same time, we started to see an increase in crime. Uh, the, the number of homicides cre uh, uh, by the 4th ID was 114% 
of the rest of the, the city's population. I remember coming off the base one day and, and looking up, they had this sign up that talked about a uh, number of DUIs. It said something close to 200, and I told my friend, I said, that's pretty high for this time of year. And he said, no, that's just the month. I go, wow, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Uh, the homicides were being created by troops that had already run into problems with drugs and alcohol. And I thought, what is happening to our community? In April 2009, I get a call from a friend out in California. She's just heard uh, 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 General Barry uh, talk about uh, uh, veterans treatment courts. And she says, I want your help. And I, she explained the program to me and I said, whatever you need, I'll give it to you. Just let me know what you need. She said, I don't know what I need at this point, but I want your support. So a couple weeks later, I run into uh, our state attorney general and I, I tw tweeted her and I said, I'm getting ready to talk to the attorney general about your issue. I present the issue to him, he says, I love it. A few minutes later, I run into one of our state legislators. I present the issue to her and she says, I wanna run a bill like that. So over the summer of 2009, we wrote legislation uh, to create veterans treatment courts in Colorado. I'm proud to say that in February of 2010, that legislation went through both the House, the Senate, and both judiciary committees without a single nay vote. We, we really worked hard to get that established up there. Along, along that time, I started coming up to Washington and, and meeting with our, our, our federal legislators, our senators, and our congressmen who were running various bills up here. Uh, somewhere along the line, I showed up on uh, Wes Huddleston's radar. He invited me over to the NADCP. I learned more about uh, the drug courts and the DWI courts and the veterans treatment courts, and I said, I want to be part of this. He invited me on to be uh, on, onto the board, and last year I was elected to the board of directors for NADCP. And I want to tell you, I'm humbled and proud to be part of this organization that's doing so much for our United States. Thank you. We're limited, uh, we could go on and on, but we're limited by time. Let's thank all of our distinguished panelists for this great discussion today. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow is the big rally on Capitol Hill when we uh, make the ask. Let's go do it. Let's get the word to every member of Congress and to every United States Senator that drug courts work. Thank you again, panelists. Thank you, NADCP members and guests. Thank you for being here. The Parade of Transformation is next. And believe me, nobody who stays and, and is here for this Parade of Transformation Nobody who hears from these drug court graduates and families will ever forget this experience. Nobody. I guarantee it's an experience you'll never, ever forget. Thank you and God bless. <laughs>